Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Horasis Extraordinary Meeting. My name is Brendan Davis, and I'm very pleased to be moderating this event today on populism versus multilateralism. And I have a, just a few comments up front, and I want to introduce our panel. My point of view on this is I am primarily a filmmaker, which is really a storyteller. So the stories we tell ourselves, the stories we tell humanity, the stories we tell about ourselves to the world, wherever we are, of course, shape the dialogue. And this conversation, our topic today, could not be more relevant. And if you've been watching the other events or attending or speaking at other events, you know that, that this is in the air. So although Horasis is very much a neutral, as Frank likes to say, uh, you know, Horasis is Switzerland. So it takes a very neutral position. However, my comment going into this, not to skew us too much, but just to put this on the table, we cannot avoid that this event has discussed in great detail the impacts because of political decisions. And, and this is never more prevalent and relevant than it is right now, 2020, October 1. Um, I'm here in the States, as are several of us. And this is an international issue, though. So we have a very distinguished panel. First of all, I would like to introduce our panel. And, and I'm going to apologize. I've done my best to get everyone's name correct. They will please correct me gently if I manage to mangle it. Um, uh, first, we have um, Pallavi Aluwalia. Did I did I say your last name? Probably. I, I'm calling you your first name. Um, Pallavi is the managing attorney at um, Aluwalia Law Offices here in the States, focusing on immigration law specifically. Um, Scott Francis has not yet joined us. He is the chief executive officer of BP3. I'm going to allow for Scott to sort of parachute in because a lot of people have had a technical issue where they kind of come in or out. And um, we have um, Hans Kohler, who's a professor at the University of Innsbruck at Austria. And we have Sanjit Sethi, the president of the Minneapolis College of Art and Design here in the U.S. So the panel topics, the prompt we're given, we're going to use this as our framework, but essentially just for me to put this in the air because people are jumping around. So the, the, the panel prompt is across the globe, many people have voted for a change to a so-called people's government sometimes presided over by a cult figure who promises a more active government, especially against COVID-19. So our questions to start us off are, how do you think that radical change can be enacted so that all voters agree? And do populist governments incline at all towards, towards multilateralism? And those seem like sort of rhetorical questions, but I would like to start with uh, Pallavi. Could you please say hello and tell everyone your sort of default position on this? And we'll go around the circle here. Surely, of course. So my perspective comes in um, as an immigrant, as well as an immigration lawyer, where I've represented uh, people from all over the world who are coming here uh, to partake in the American experiment and find the growth that they wish to do. So this, um, the rise of populism that I saw over the last several years. So Im immigration law was just, you know, one of the uh, practitioner practice areas or you know it was a silent hum of the american machine but uh, it was not um, that much political or in the news or anything till uh, we saw the rise of populism and uh, we saw that immigrants were targeted uh, more um, for statements to be made and uh, they were necessarily not uh, multilateral in its aspects so uh, my experience over the last several years with the rise of the cult figure comes from my experience as a professional practicing in immigration law, um, seeing that. And uh, just to kind of uh, just quickly uh, just uh, introduce one more part, if I were to look at many, many different action items that the government took, I can just take a um, uh, point with the uh, UN convention uh, to which US is a signatory and by which about uh, Almost 100,000 refugees would come in every year. And this number dwindled down to 18,000 uh, that was going to be allowed for the entire year. And out of those 18,000, thanks to COVID and whatever we have going on right now, uh, again, more uh, closed borders, we have only maybe 8,000 that have come in. So this calls for action for everyone to think a little globally, and we'll talk more about this. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kohler. For me, the problematic aspect of uh, this discussion about populism versus multilateralism is 
that uh, the terms are not always uh, used uh, very precisely. Because what uh, does populism really mean? It is based on the Latin term populus, which means people. So if it is, a, if it uh, means a kind of politics or political approach that is uh, focused on the people, uh, that would be what democracy is all about. Uh, the issue is that uh, this term has uh, been uh, used now since uh, quite sometime in a kind of uh, polemical sense. So everybody would like to be democratic and uh, would uh, like to avoid uh, a populist approach. But if we analyze what democracy, the way it is practiced in the industrialized world and in the West means, we cannot deny that there is a kind of tendency towards populism built into the system because representative democracy in the form of parliamentarism means competition between uh, a number of parties or interest groups or whatever, pressure groups quite often also. And uh, that means that each of the competitors for the votes of the citizens will try to please a certain uh, a group or clientele and uh, will stir up emotions in order to uh, get more support. And that, uh, and it's very difficult to make a precise um, distinction between a routine, so to speak, uh, democratic procedure and, or electoral campaign and uh, an approach or a method that is uh, populist. And quite often, and that's the problem in Europe, one is using, uh, one group is using this term to uh, just discredit the other. But anyhow, the, for me, the big issue, because the overall topic is populism versus multilateralism, the big issue is how can the nation state, and we still do not have a world state, we have a community of nation states that are built on the concept of national sovereignty and that uh, are also um, based on the um, national interest. How can this community of almost uh, 200 now states of such a multitude of states uh, interact in a way which is really multilateral and not just a kind of uh, chaotic and egotistic enforcement of the national interest of each and every state. And let's not overlook that uh, every politician in every state, I would say, when taking the oath of office is making a solemn commitment to serve the interests of the nation, or whatever the wording may be in the United States is, I think, to serve the, the or to respect the Constitution. In my country, it is to serve the interests of the nation and the people and so on. And uh, what, but what does this imply? This is not an oath to serve the interests of mankind, but it is an oath related to the well-being of one group in distinction from the other groups of one's, uh, the people of one state in distinction from the, all the peoples of the other state. So my point would be, uh, this uh, intrinsically unilateral uh, philosophy, so to speak, of the state and of the responsibility of the politician to uh, assert the interests of his or her state in the sense of my country first, America first, whatever, whatever country first. Uh, this can only be made compatible with international cooperation and multilateralism. If one defines this kind of unilateral structure of each and every state in what I call a rational sense. And if one asserts, uh, if every state asserts, we are not alone. There are others who have the same, uh, who also give priority to their national interest. So how to deal with this? By the way, uh, it was quite interesting for me. The president of the United States raised it again this year 
in the United Nations General Assembly. But the only national approach is if we accept that each and every state uh, is pursuing its national interest and putting its uh, the people of the country first, that uh, we have to accept the principle of mutuality. I can only be. I will only, in the medium and long term, be successful with my state if I take into account that all the others give the same priority to their community so that we have to negotiate our uh, the assertion or the, the uh, how we go ahead with the pursuit of our interests. And we have to make deals, we have to make compromises, and that, in my view, would also be the role of the United Nations to be a forum of this kind of uh, negotiations and of this kind of um, making compromises about the uh, one's national interests. And that brings me to one additional point, which is also related to the overall topic for our panel, um, populism versus multilateralism. We have the United Nations organization as intergovernmental entity uh, to uh, be, so to speak, a facilitator of this interaction between these sovereign states as sovereign entities. The problem is, on paper, it looks beautiful. If you read the Charter of the United Nations, and in particular the preamble, it's all about uh, dialogue, about coexistence, about peace, and about collective security, which m means a multilateral and not a unilateral approach. But in actual fact, when uh, one uh, reads the fine print, which most of the people don't do, when one reads the fine print, when one reads uh, the uh, specific provisions for decision-making of the most powerful body of the United Nations, namely the Security Council, one realizes that there is that the UN cannot be a real framework for multilateral cooperation because decisions about war and peace, including also decisions about other coercive measures, such as the imposition of punitive sanctions on entire countries, uh, are effectively made only by five countries, namely the permanent members of the Security Council who have the veto right. That means each, any, any of these five countries is in a position to block any decision on issues of war and peace. At, and at the same time, in the Security Council, there is no obligation to abstain from voting if a country is uh, itself the aggressor or is itself involved in a dispute, which right. means that uh, any of these five countries can, in fact, act as it pleases under all circumstances. There is absolutely no procedure uh, to reign in the country or to hold that country responsible. Because if there is a, res a resolution is brought up, the country can vote against it. For that reason, what I say, if we want to be credible in our calls for multilateralism and in our condemnation of a totally unilateral approach, as the one, for instance, which uh, President Trump now so often uh, propagates, if we want to be credible, we have also to address the issue of the world organization and we should call for a reform of the decision making because if decision making is only a kind of uh, multilateral coordination among five countries, excluding uh, all the others, excluding uh, around 190 uh, countries, sovereign entities, uh, uh, one is not credible in uh, in this uh, call for a, a multilateral approach, and one is also not credible in condemnation or critique of populist approaches that are associated with uh, a, an absolute emphasis on my country alone and on a kind of refusal of uh, compromises and dialogue. Thank you very much, Dr. Kohler. And um, again, for uh, opening comments, I will give it to uh, Professor Sethi. 
Um, thank you, and I appreciate this opportunity. And I'd say it's been great to hear from uh, both of my panelists here. I mean, I have to say in general, uh, as an educator and as uh, as the president of an art and design college um, um, in the United States, um, I, you know, I think um, I think we're at a really pivotal moment to have discussions like these. Um, uh, I think there's never been a more important time to really kind of drill into um, what the nature of multilateralism is um, and its uh, and its tension uh, and push and pull with populism. I have to say. Um, I am in general uh, allergic to binaries. Um, uh, so the moment I see a versus on something, uh, uh, I'm an immediate skeptic. Uh, and I think uh, uh, as my previous two panelists have, has started to suss out and I'm hoping we can tuck into more is that um, this is anything if binary or an either or. Um, uh, what we're looking at here is a complex series of intricate levers um, that are uh, intricately attached to each other that involve everything, not just from populism and multilateralism, uh, but certainly uh, everything from humanist philosophies that you start to see and being um, and really um, uh, being expanded upon. And I'm thinking about ones like the Ubuntu philosophy um, um, of humanity. I am because uh, because we are and seeing how that can be expanded on a, a scale for nation states, um, but also about uh, complex issues regarding nationalism and hyper nationalism as we start to see as it relates to populism. Um, uh, I, I have a fundamental belief uh, that this is not about kind of an either or kind of equation. Uh, I think this is about uh, truly understanding uh, the nature of how our society is understanding and growing and changing and where those tension points are. I'd have to say, in many ways, uh, our focus on uh, national identity and, and, and the identity and sovereignty of nation states is one piece of this. However, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking... The fact that Pallavi is here also as an immigration attorney and can speak, I'm assuming, profoundly to the idea that how uh, uh, national um, uh, uh, sovereignty is only one piece of when you're starting to talk about uh, what a true definition of what populism or uh, multilateralism means. I think that's an excellent point, and and I think that between the three of you, um, also Scott Francis is. Um, I saw someone try to join. I think maybe he's having connection difficulties. I can't manage that and run the panel. So hopefully Scott can join us. I saw somebody try to come in for a moment, but um, so far all of you have have put these things into the air that really do get to the to the core issue, as Dr. Kohler said, and as Sanji elaborated. There, there's sort of a false falsity in the premise um, because we have to drill a little deeper. And the fact that we have people with an academic and a philosophical and a practical on the ground immigration experience, among all your other skills and purviews, gives us a lot to talk about because they're underlying human issues that drive these motives. And we can't segment it at a border, at, the, at an artificial line, as, as, as was sort of put into the air. I want to go with my first question to Pallavi, and then we'll sort of go around the room here. Oh, it looks like she might have dropped off. So hopefully she'll pop back on. But so th there's the issue of COVID-19 and how do we function in this environment? So I'd like to talk about some functional aspects because, again, has been has has been elucidated very nicely a moment ago by Dr. Kohler. Um, solving the philosophical issues is 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 probably a topic for more than a 45 minute panel. And we want to be actionable. So probably you again, you're very involved on the ground with the effects of, of, of policy. And this affects, of course, people's immigration status, but it also ends up having trickle down and knock on effects. And that's one aspect that reflects these trends. How is this affecting your practice and the people you're dealing with? And what are your thoughts vis-a-vis -vis this greater topic from your point of view? And we'll go around the, uh, go around the room with commentary. Sure. So as lawyers, we interpret, um, uh, you know, decisions that come out from the courts or in the case of immigration law, there is the INA, uh, which is the Immigration Nationality Act. And right now, what we are finding ourselves spending more time doing is to be interpreting proclamations and executive orders that rolled through the White House. OK, Immigra the executive does have a lot of power to execute uh, immigration law. That is the authority given uh, to the president uh, and the executive branch. But we're in the constant mode of new executive orders that are popping up. So uh, 
you know, uh, he took the the oath um, in January of 2017. We had what we call the Muslim ban uh, that happened that was uh, uh, creating uh, fear uh, that uh, some countries were sending us unwetted people. Uh, and of course, every country has a right, um, whether you call it populist or not, to secure their borders. So that was all good. But uh, we had uh, that come through. Then we had a few other uh, unfriendly orders come to. And just to kind of give you uh, uh, a point on that, the uh, the Muslim ban that was announced at that point, again, to protect the U.S., uh, was challenged a couple of times because um, it was matched with the rhetoric that was prior to the election that said, I, you know, I'm going to be strong against the Muslims. So, uh, so when the courts reviewed it, so what the way they got that to pass, because eventually the courts have allowed that to go through and, and we in effect have a ban against seven or eight countries, um, uh, where people need only exceptions to be able to allow, uh, be allowed in the country. But the way that they added it, they added North uh, Korea onto the list of those countries, North Korea with uh, a country with uh, uh, which we've never had diplomatic ties. And, and so they added it and now it met the court's test of saying that this was not populistic or it was just more to secure borders. And that uh, ban now stands. Now, uh, and of course, there have been others throughout, different proclamations, different interpretations. Um, currently, um, uh, when uh, COVID started out, uh, we had uh, a set of uh, announcements and proclamations, which are in effect right now. So a lot of people uh, who are outside the country, and we have a steady flow of immigrants on an annual basis. The fiscal year starts 1st of October and 30th of uh, September, and the quotas that are established for immigrants that come into the country. Um, now, uh, so for this year, there were still people that were incoming. Of course, COVID shut down consulates, so people practically could not come. Uh, the flights got shut down. People could not fly. And then we had executive orders. So people who had gone abroad and they were uh, you know, you know, there's a very uh, well-known category known as the H-1B worker, which is a specialized engineer doctor kind of, you know, uh, um, symbolized by the most educated. Uh, they left and um, the country and they may have gone for a vacation before COVID hit. And the announcement stranded a lot of them outside. So uh, right now there was an exception called a national interest exception that came in. Uh, that says, okay, if you qualify for some criteria, maybe you'll be able to come in. So we have all of those that are ongoing. So in my practice, um, as an immigration attorney, um, this is, we're not looking at the larger picture of the law. We're looking at narrow carve outs, which are populist, uh, in their spirit. COVID, um, has kind of supported them, obviously, uh, and, and have kind of, even made it more uh, narrow in terms of its entry. So that's what I'm experiencing right now. And I know you have this question to ask of others. Absolutely. Who would like to jump in on this in terms of, you know, practical effects? And I'm thinking, again, the, the prompt gives us COVID, but we have someone with this very direct experience as vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, humans from around the world. So um, who would like to, to, uh, to go next? If I may say something about uh, the so-called uh, populist parties or governments uh, and uh, COVID, the irony is, if we use the term populism for a moment in that sense, describing a movement or a, a leader that uh, emphasizes in a very emotional and extreme way the national interest as uh, opposed to the interest uh, of uh, the other states and who exaggerates, so to speak, the, the national aspect. If we use populism in this sense, many of the right-wing parties would fall in this category. And it, as far as COVID is concerned, the irony is that th those groups and governments that uh, proclaim the priority of the uh, interests of uh, the people of them, of their own country versus the people of all the others, that they, in most cases, uh, uh, are the worst as far as effective measures of containment of this pandemic is concerned. This is the case, for instance, in my country, 
in Austria, where the uh, and in many other countries in Europe too, where the right wing uh, movements or populist movements strictly act against any scientifically based rational methods of containment. That means they would uh, be against uh, the um, uh, face masks, they would be against uh, large, uh, against restricting uh, social gatherings, against social distancing and so on, all in the name of, uh, a, in my view, infantile understanding of uh, freedom, immature understanding of freedom in, a, in an egotistic and egomaniac uh, sense. And they do, they, they uh, I think, uh, express these uh, views and implement such policies in order to please certain groups of the electorate. But the effect is that in all those countries where this kind of populist approach is being applied, the uh, situation of the pandemic is um, very, very uh, serious and it's getting out of control. And uh, that is, uh, in my view, also one of the uh, one sign of the uh, rather irrational approach of uh, uh, the populist uh, politics. And um, to me, it seems to be similar also to what uh, what we see in the United States, where uh, exactly those who proclaim that they only wants to uphold the rights of uh, their citizens of their country, the, uh, their performance in terms of uh, containment and of saving lives of their own citizens is much worse uh, than the performance of others who are, uh, who are uh, in favor of uh, stricter measures of containment and uh, who do not uh, follow a populist or right-wing line. I appreciate that. And sometimes there's a delay. Apologies for stepping on you. And I'm going to go to Sanjeet next to pick up on this, what you're going to say. And also I'm going to add another nuance, please, because you said something in your opening comments that I especially want to expand us our conversation on, which really gets to, so please pick it up from here, Sanjeet, but also this is really a philosophical problem, as all of you have said. Dr. Kohler elucidated it very clearly, and all of you have commented on this in, in, in some way. And specifically, Sanjeet, you were you were discussing what I'm thinking of is the, you know, th th these these are different worldviews that seem unreconcilable to me from my own point of view. So that is, we have a fairly, as all of you have commented in some way, we have a fairly difficult task. It, it's it's sort of a false dichotomy without me going on about it, because I want to hear from you, and so does everyone else. But Sanjeet, what do you think? I mean, how do we, what are the effects you see of this? And also, uh, on a more philosophical level, is there a way to bridge this gap? Or, or every, is everyone just in such a different reality that this is sort of a, a bridge that cannot be crossed? What do you, how do you think we move forward with this dynamic where, again, we're the three of us, Dr. Kohler is not in the States, so the rest of us are in the States, and we can't deny what's the, the horror show that's been happening on television. Even my most sort of principled conservative friends who are, you know, they want to argue about the marginal tax rate. They don't want kids in cages, and they don't want these horrible, you know, inhumane sort of policies we've seen through this, this so-called populist. That's not a popular position. It's a strongman position. So... Uh, Sanjeet, I'm throwing a lot of word salad in the air. Could you make something tasty out of what I'm giving you here? Well, yeah, I'm, I, you know, I can try. But I, first of all, I want to pick up, you know, where mm -hmm. my, my previous panelists were. And yeah. actually, I think, you know, talking about COVID is a perfect example. And I, and I think, uh, uh, like, you know, like Hans just mentioned, I, you are not seeing any uh, far right wing nationalist or national, you know, national populist movements going ahead and um, in and urging a greater conviction and adherence to science or mask wearing or physical distancing at all. And since um, uh, it's quite the opposite, and I think that that's a very telling piece of this dynamic. Um, and then you have to start to understand. 
um, how individuals use uh, uh, populism and they ride the wave of populism and right wing nationalism uh, to come into power because it's easy to go ahead and, and talk about um, uh, kind of these uh, uh, vague terms of freedom um, and going ahead and trying to paint uh, individuals um, as being anti-freedom or anti-space. Uh, At the same time, the irony is, is that um, uh, when you see groups like this that start to avoid any kind of adherence to science um, or to reasonable public health policies um, uh, or individuals that talk about freedom, all of a sudden go ahead and have incredible restrictions on those freedoms. And so I think, I think for me, um, there has to be an understanding, uh, not just about um, where these uh, for these forces exist. There's a there's a very there's a very different dialogue going on with individuals that feel like that they have, and that's why I mentioned the kind of the, the um, humanist philosophies that you see, you know, um, in in, um, in all sorts of places. But where uh, people are uh, feeling um, um, a degree of fidelity to a nation state, but they're not doing it with a way that comes with the foment and the conviction and the following xenophobia. Um, uh, you know, living in Minneapolis, Minnesota, we know that uh, we know that the the pandemic of of COVID nineteen is just the overlay of the broader pandemic of racism that has existed as, as an institutional legacy uh, in this country. Uh, it's one that it's deeply embedded within uh, aspects of xenophobia and in, in this notion um, um, that is now kind of coming to rise of right-wing nationalism and its relationship to populist rhetoric. Um, uh, I, I think, again, um, uh, I don't think it's irreconcilable to have um, an understanding and a conviction of one's own uh, 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 nation state as an identity um, without feeling like you need to kind of um, um, go into the territory of, uh, of populism. Uh, I think uh, again, for me, I think it is about understanding uh, why does populism exists now in a way that the world is moving to, a, in many ways, a much more multicultural and multinational uh, uh, philosophy and, and understanding um, um, and kind of baseline standard. Um, and I think a lot of this has to do um, uh, with individuals that are seeing uh, their life um, in the way that they view things uh, changing dramatically. And I liken this a little bit to uh, the, the, the Australian uh, scholar Glenn, Glenn Albrecht, uh, who coined a really interesting term to talk about climate change called solastalgia. And solastalgia was the idea of looking at the, your climate or your world disappearing in front of you and feeling a ter certain type of sadness. Um, uh, I actually, uh, which I think is interesting to think of, even in the terms of when we haven't really understood the enormity of, uh, of the loss uh, due to this current pandemic, there's a version of solastalgia that's going on. Uh, I would argue that that the crush of populism is in part because of a of, of individuals uh, that are feeling uh, the vestige of their power structure um, and, and and their lifestyle um, that is going to need uh, to be dramatically changed or or shared in a way uh, that they're not able to go ahead and confine and categorize and hold. Well, I want to jump in only quickly to say that we have these panels fly by and we only have about 12 minutes left. So I want the three of you to have an open discussion, building on what we've just put out there so far in terms of solutions. And everyone has identified problems and 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 how are you acting in your world, whether it's your direct interest the people you're influencing and speaking with, how are you in your purview engaging with this topic? And what do you think the future is? I really want to get some, get all of your best thoughts about how can we best learn to, 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 to live and work together. I mean, I don't know a more pointed way to say it. That's really what this is about. We're, we're people, we're, we're always living in our own realities to some degree, but there is something of a consensus reality in theory, despite, you know, living in the States. So how do you see us moving forward? Let me go to Paula B first and we'll go kind of back around the circle with um, Hans and Sanji. Surely. So it shows that I have a little bit of an, an um, uh, unstable network, but if it does and something happens and you could move on to the next one. Um, uh, okay. Brendan. We hear you fine. So, so. Uh, my would be, yeah. Okay. 
So my my suggestion would be so there is a, a you know a cry for action which is think globally act locally uh, and I think uh, this uh, kind of cry uh, pertained more to the area of uh, um, uh, the environment right so where uh, you know uh, it was to think you know think and act locally here for the sake of the world's environment but I think this can pertain to do with everything it could pertain to education it could be uh, for business and i would say that it would be more act locally to think globally right and i would say that um, till you can include a lot of more people to understand and i think when you have to when you call people to understand and uh, i mean you can look at twitter feeds and you know how it, there's xenophobia there's just just anger Right. And you just wonder what inspires that anger. And it could be uh, for people for a lack of, um, you know, not doing well in where they are, um, not being educated enough, not having a global thought uh, that comes to them. And, and that's why, you know, uh, these movements take root. And then, you know, I mean, they get the um, uh, the flames are fanned by people who are not doing well. So I I would say the call to action should be to educate about globalism so it's not to just uh, localize i mean we're right now uh, and again and i'm sure this is something that's part of the news that's uh, been attended to about an order that says that no more diversity training right so we're not going to have diversity and anyone that's feeding into the federal government in uh, in the us uh, they're saying that that is just a hype which does not exist we know that not to be true Right. So this is the opposite. We're right now at the opposite of educating and involving and getting everyone together and making them think of a larger world. But I, at this, at some point, I think it's the bottom line, though, is the bottom line to what matters to people. Right. It could be, uh, you know, what uh, uh, Sanjeet was talking about, too, like they're kind of sad about losing, you know, something that was in their past, which they don't see anymore. There were more, you know, a certain kind of people around them. And now they see a mix and that kind of gives them a little bit of anxiety. That's one part. Um, but I would also say it's just the bottom line. So say, for example, you start doing well. Thanks to an international, uh, you know, global trade, or you're starting to do well because of something that impacts you, you would be keen to make this a global, uh, you know, to, to give your nod to globalism and to multilateralism as opposed to, you know, shutting off your borders. But people who are not, and again, we talk about the hinterlands and we talk about the, you know, mid part of the country where, you know, people don't just go, but it, we have a lot of states, uh, uh, which which, uh, you know, have done trade with China and have benefited, right? Mm -hmm. They have benef benefited from that trade. And when I see a lot of people from there that espouse the, um, the populistic uh, mode, it kind of troubles me because they are part of that growth. The farms are growing because of that. They have, uh, you know, they are consumers as well as suppliers uh, to the larger global markets, and they should be more keen about uh, to, to participate. But to me, of course, the global uh, uh, globalism is about education. It's about uh, including more people. It's about inclusiveness, and it is at some point economic. And if it's economic and it's part of it, people will be less populist in their uh, thought process, even though they're letting go of what we know is, you know, that anxiety that they feel with other colors that they see around. So, and I'll pass it to the next uh, panelist. Mahan, sir. Yeah. My suggestion would be to inject uh, a, an element of uh, rationality into the uh, even populist approach or into the nationalist approach. Uh, as I said earlier, I listened with interest to the speech of the President of the United States recently at the General Assembly of the United Nations, where he said that uh, his um, foreign policy maxim is my country first, America first. But at the same time, he encouraged each and every of the leaders of the states uh, attending the General Assembly. That means he encouraged all the leaders of the community of states uh, to do the same and also to say my country first. But uh, rationally, that makes only sense 
if uh, one defines the national interest on the basis of mutuality. And that is also, that reflects the reality in the globalized world. The kind of interaction and interdependence that exists now in the 21st century means that no country can flourish in splendid isolation. So a rational understanding of national interest, a rational understanding of uh, 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 asserting the interests of one's own community means uh, to do this on the basis of mutuality and means uh, to do this on the basis of compromises. Domestically, of course, the problem is often um, even more complicated because now we have uh, the multicultural reality, not anymore just at the worldwide level. At the worldwide level, it has always existed, a multitude of civilizations and cultures. Now, many of those states that have been homogenous nation states for centuries, particularly in Europe, are multicultural states. And that uh, is uh, a problem in terms of the identity and uh, self-assertion of uh, the traditional um, um, communities in those states. And uh, here it is much more difficult uh, to uh, um, succeed with this kind of rational approach. But if I may just make a comment con concerning the domestic situation as far as uh, the United States is concerned, I did participate a few hours earlier in another meeting and I had uh, a chat conversation with the uh, governor of Oregon in the United States about the uh, situation in the U.S. right now and about the divisions and uh, all these uh, the political conflicts related to COVID and uh, to the other racial issues and so on. And uh, <clears throat> as far as I have seen, there are politicians, as for instance, the governor of Oregon, who tell us uh, that in their experience, it is certainly also possible to deal uh, that uh, people of uh, one particular um, uh, affi political affiliation, in this case, Democratic Party, can are in a position to deal rationally on, on the basis of mutual respect with people on the other side. And uh, the governor told us when I asked her about uh, a business-like and uh, cooperative uh, relationship between the um, federal government and um, the uh, state government of her state. She gave us examples of uh, quite fruitful cooperation also based on uh, the COVID situation uh, with uh, be between governors representing uh, different political affiliations. Okay. But uh, the issue generally at the nation state level, at the domestic level is that because of the uh, international situations, because of the international tension, particularly between the Muslim world and the West, now many people in uh, traditional, um, traditionally homogenous nation states, particularly in Europe, feel insecure and uh, it would need, it would require highly responsible and highly educated leaders to give a kind of, to be able or to give a kind of assurance uh, to the population that uh, diversity and the presence of communities with different religious and cultural identities is not a threat to their own identity. So far, I haven't seen leaders with that uh, caliber in uh, that part of the world, which I know best, I mean, in, in the Western I, I, We're about to run out of time. I need to give Sanjit a few moments. I'm sorry to jump in, Dr. Kohler. Sanjit, give you the yeah. last word. Apologies for such a short time frame, everyone, please. No, it's okay. Well, you know, I, you know, I have to say that I think we're at a stage where we need more complexity, uh, not less. Uh, I think we're at a stage where 
Um, um, it, it's an outmoded argument to say this notion of singularity, which is in some ways, I think, what oftentimes populism kind of boils down to, um, is is even really anything more than fiction, uh, in a sense, because uh, uh, many of these individuals that are talking about populism uh, very much relish the supply chains that are that uh, that really um, uh, certainly transcend uh, these types of borders. I, I really appreciate this conversation today, and I, I know we're running out of time. I apologize, and and it will keep. We will stay alive a moment until it cuts us off. People, people are still in the group, so we can sort of wrap it up for anyone who's. We have a few guests with us. I see. Thank you both for. Um, I can't read the Cyrillic, so hello to our student in Ukraine and to uh, Gravinder with the same last name as Halabi. Is that a? Is that a? More than me. My excellent, husband. excellent. Hello, nice to nice to meet you virtually at three a.m. today. Excellent. Um, but I really thank you all. And I, I, I have to say that, that we were given uh, quite a task to weigh in on this. And uh, I appreciate all the thoughts. I hope that I hope that everyone who stopped in with us enjoyed it. And I look forward to uh, hearing more from all of you. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Nice talking thank you. to you. Excellent. Thank you so much, yes. Appreciate thank you. you guys. Very, very much a pleasure. And um, I look forward to following your work. And please, please stay in touch. And if you're ever in Los Angeles, or you need the help of a of a global filmmaker type, I'm I'm glad to uh, oh. lend you my lend you my ear. I'm a film and TV producer primarily, and I I was just oh. living in China for the better part of seven years. I've only been back in the states since late January. I have I was on the I I got out of China four days before they shut down the airports. Wow. Yeah. I just hope that uh, uh, next year it will be possible to resume international travel. Because I was planning for this month now, for for next month, for October, I was planning an international meeting on uh, responsibility in international affairs. And it Mm. would be so timely timely now, but we had to postpone it because it's impossible to bring people to Vienna. Because Mm. now Vienna is also on on the red list of many countries. And uh, there is a travel alert, so... Right. It's very unfortunate that uh, we have to stay put. <laughs> my my fiance is back in Beijing. My fiance, she's Chinese, lives in China, and my yeah. my next project is actually a. This is all not saving the world. I my life sounds charmed. I mean, I do these sorts of engagements and consulting, specifically mm-hmm. global entertainment and cultural communications, is sort of my specialty. Um, and, but but my next project is a big movie project in Paris that was set up. I would be there. We would actually have started shooting yeah. uh, uh, Monday, oh. but yeah. it's next fall now. And yeah, yeah. but it's yeah. but everyone's life is 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 up in the air. Thank you so, so much. Brendan, shoot us yeah. an email and tell us what we should look out for uh, to to get one of your to view one of the things that you've produced oh, or directed. Oh, sure. Well, I, to see it. if you can give us, I'm sure we can find it online. I can. I can well, I sure. I I I, I produce Fair everything from in the like group. theatrical movies to um. Uh, I, I I'm sort of one half documentary. And then one half, you know, fiction. Oh, and we'd love to watch those. So I have a lot of things kind of out there. Yeah. But it's, okay. it's really a pleasure. Thank you for your time. Really appreciate Thank it. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Nice talking to you. Thank all you. The best Likewise. To you. Very nice. Very nice to meet you both. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye.